Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished panel. I really want to get to them very, very quickly. But first, just a few data points. We've heard some very powerful uh, messages uh, earlier today, thanks to uh, our hosts today, uh, but as well as Congressman uh, Wolf, always a powerful spokes on these issues, and, and my good friend Piero. But uh, very great panel, they're very distinguished, so I won't run through their resumes, but let me start out with my good friend, uh, Aaron Walsh, former Deputy Assistant to the President and uh, direct, Senior Director at the National Security Council for African Affairs, followed by, uh, next to her, of course, is Stephen Anada. Uh, needs no introduction for everyone here, but very active on really a profit in many ways in these matters. And finally, our host today, Nathan Estreth, the founder of the 1792 Exchange. Um, just a couple of data points just to set a stage here. And this is just from my news feed this morning, uh, things I picked up. Uh, yesterday in McCurdy and Benway State, that's in the middle belt, about 300 miles or so from uh, Abuja, the Nigerian capital, uh, the Roman Catholic Bishop of the Diocese of McCurdy, Bishop Wilfred Anagma, commissioned a new lab to test for various things uh, and treatment of uh, critical illnesses with infants. And in his address, part of which was reported, he cried because he said, we, we're not keeping ahead. We're, for this lab we're commissioning replaces uh, two labs, one in Sitterkula and the other in Ude, both in the Guma local government area, which had been destroyed by attacks in recent days. So new lab, but two destroyed. Uh, News came in yesterday, sad news, up from Borno State, and uh, Piero mentioned the former governor, Shetima, uh, in Borno State, uh, near there, uh, next door in Adamawa, the kidnapping of Pastor Jerry Hinjari. Kidnapped last week, his body was found on the roadside. So this is what's going on everyday Nigeria. Uh, last year, Open Doors World Watch List, not 89% of Christians martyred last year were in Nigeria. Uh, 5,014, according to their count, uh, uh, making it the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. And so that, with that, let me turn to start out with Aaron. Aaron, uh, we look at these statistics, these anecdotes, we've heard these powerful testimonies. Uh, we know why it matters to us morally, but why does it matter strategically? Uh, does it lessen Nigeria's strategic import uh, to us? Uh, how does it affect it? Thanks, Peter. That's a great um, question, and thank you all for being here today. I think from a national security perspective, Nigeria is critically important for a number of reasons. So let's put aside any emotion, or moral, or anything, and look at it strictly from national security. As the largest nation on the African continent, there's a lot to be said for that, not only in terms of the growing population. As you said, from um, in 2050, they're going to be the third largest country in the world. Um, so from our perspective, there's a lot that can happen from, from that aspect in terms of violence that you see that's going on right now. But what, how could that impact the United States? What are our interests in, in Nigeria? So one of the main things is, let's just look at it from an economic standpoint. You've got a huge growing population that has a lot that's very, very smart. Nigerians are extremely smart individuals. We see that here in the United States. So many of the diaspora are leaders here in different fields. In technology, Nigeria is one of the top in the capital and throughout at the academic institutions. That's important to the United States and for Americans. Um, the security situation in the north and then moving towards the middle belt, that's very, very dangerous. Um, as Piero pointed out, the intent of the Islamists, and although the United States has taken the focus off terrorism to a degree in the last few years because there's been more important interests that we have to focus on to protect the American people and their interests, we cannot take an eye off what's going on in um, Nigeria. Nathan, let me turn to you. You gave a very powerful 
uh, set of opening remarks to us, talking about companies that hear no evil, see no evil, while this is all going on. Uh, you indicted them for moral incoherence and for being enablers. Uh, let's drill down on that. Uh, Aaron has just told us about why this is so important for U.S. interests, the strategic interests here. Uh, on the business side of it, uh, what impact does this have? Have you seen this type of persecution have on companies' bottom line and how they should respond to it? Yeah, I, I think it's an, it's an important question as we talk about how to engage these companies. And I'll, I'll start with what I mentioned at the beginning. I think they undermine their moral authority with their employees and customers and shareholders when they turn a blind eye. So first and foremost, um, just operating as you know an entity within a society that upholds the law, um, when you turn a blind eye to evil, right, it, it, it lessens your ability to impact in so many other areas, right? But it also, from a business standpoint, uh, you know, stability is really important, right? And so trying to sell goods or services in a conflict zone is much more challenging, right, and almost impossible, right, than in a stable country. Third, you have you know, what, what now are increasingly the, the migrations and exodus, and you, know, you, you want to actually not only have stability, but encourage the dignity of every human being and life such that your customers can thrive and flourish, right? And so that, that allows you to grow your business as well. I, I would also just point one thing, which is I think there are, from a corporate standpoint, some geopolitical um, thoughts on this as well. And, and that is, if you really look at the origins of ESG that are pushing these corporations to stay mum in some areas while they scream from the rooftops in others, especially in a U.S. context, um, that that ESG tie back to the United Nations and China is a specific directive, right, to accomplish geopolitical goals by China. And those who have headed that at the UN have been Chinese nationals, right? China is the major beneficiary of the environmental side of the push to net zero 50 from a geopolitical and a commercial standpoint. And so it's really important as you think about that, especially given oil and gas in Nigeria, as well as the broader just standing up for those who are being persecuted Christians, right, on moral authority. It all wraps in that if you're really going to be a leader that advances the interests of your company, you need to step in and find your voice on this issue and stand up for your employees and your customers. Thank you. Stephen, you've been uh, a prophetic voice about this for a long, long time. You've had your wins, but uh, those of you, us who have known you, you've also had a lot of frustration. Uh, uh, getting the message across. Uh, how, do, how do you see the situation? Thank you, Peter. Um, the situation in Nigeria is bad. Um, over four million children are out of school as a result of this uh, uh, conflict. And also we have uh, several IDPs um, in, from Benue State to Kaduna State to Plateau State to Adamawa, all of the, even in the Southwest uh, state of Nigeria that uh, uh, Boko Haram and other uh, uh, entities of particular concern like Fulani militants, they've really decimated communities, they've taken over such communities. So what we have going on in Nigeria is famine hunger and then other humanitarian crises like uh, public health issues that confront those people who live uh, in the open element in Nigeria. Now, um, my, my idea, and also, um, uh, which is actually uh, frustrating when you try to engage civil society organizations and also try to talk to um, uh, government agencies, especially uh, uh, the State Department here, I think uh, uh, the global community has not done much on this issue. And I, I see a situation whereby if the issue in Nigeria, when you talk about uh, the bad neighborhood from uh, Mali, uh, Niger, Chad, and even part of Cameroon, like you know very well when you were uh, ambassador, uh, an envoy to 
uh, Sahel. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I, what I see here is it is also from the resolution we thank God that uh, uh, Congressman Chris Smith is doing something about it, but there is a third aspect that I think can resolve this issue. Mm -hmm. And there must be what I call an uh, international commission of inquiry where uh, there must be that fact, I'm talking about EU, talking about uh, UN Human Rights Council mm -hmm. to understand and for this, from this uh, uh, commission of inquiry to establish that atrocities happen mm -hmm. and it's still happening. And also to, uh, to, to know that there are victims and also there are perpetrators. Because when you talk about administering Nigeria and talking about uh, to resolve this issue, you can't allow perpetrators to go Scot free. They must be punished. They must be prosecuted. So these are the instruments for international community mm -hmm. that must happen because you have to rally other countries, not just U.S. Yeah. alone. But we, even within the U.S., we've had frustrations and issues, and no one knows that better than Aaron. And mm -hmm. uh, we're going out on time, but yeah. talk about the, the, some of the challenges of of even getting the basic facts acknowledged. Thanks for that great question. I. It was extremely frustrating. Uh, during the Trump administration, uh, we were able to work with so many people, and uh, the Secretary of State, um, Secretary Pompeo, was so supportive of moving forward on the designation of the CTC because he saw the facts on the ground. Obviously, look at his background from Congress and um, having been um, the head of the CIA for a year before becoming the Secretary of State. That's a man who has seen the intelligence. I don't. I don't know what he saw when he was there, of course, but the facts are on the ground and they're there. However, the administration, um, while we were pushing this and also the re uh, Religious Freedom EO, we found that members in the State Department and the Africa Bureau pushed back against us severely. And the embassy themselves did not agree with any of this and they said it was just a farmer herder issue. It's not a farmer herder issue. That's so easy. It, to label it as that, because that then becomes it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is just the way it goes, and now the, with climate change and everything, and they refused to do it, and the secretary overrode them. So all secretaries listen to what the embassies have to say, what the bureau has to say. It goes up through the bureaucratic process. But it's, it's this pushback. It's this refusal to acknowledge that there is Christian persecution going around the world, and we as a nation have to step up and do something about it. We have the tools to do it, but we have to utilize those tools. And of course, what happened when President Trump left office, it was immediately reversed. And so now they're no longer a country of particular concern, even though we have all the facts before us. But I will say, and this is, I had mentioned this to Peter um, and, and our, our colleagues, Stephen, on the, on the panel here, that the Nigerians themselves here in the United States and the diaspora and the people in Lagos They've got to get involved in this much, much more. They need to speak up. They need to show what's going on. And in the districts where they are represented right now, they need to go to their members of Congress and say it. It's not just a religious issue, religious persecution, and NGOs should get involved, and pastors and whatever. As Nathan said, it's a business issue, it's a global issue, and we need to take action. So it's not just the government side, it's also the, the community and the business community as well, and Nigerians themselves. Thank you, Erin. As we wrap up, Nathan, uh, are you hopeful? I am hopeful. I think it's our job as leaders to convey hope, and I, it gives me hope just looking at those of you in this room. You each have relationships with uh, C-suite executives. You know folks who work in these companies. You know and can access your member of Congress if you live here in the United States or your government official, wherever you may have come from today. And so I think uh, we have to show up with one voice, and I uh, really appreciate uh, the fact that we can highlight this today and stand together. Uh, by God's grace, we will make a difference for the Christians that are being persecuted in Nigeria. On that note, uh, thank you very much, Nathan, and the rest of our panelists. And please give our panelists uh, a round of applause. And for all of you. <laughs> thank you.